This video is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. So why does silver outrank gold in the US military? Doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, we know gold is more valuable than silver, so why with this strange convention? The answer isn't because of what the colors or materials represent, but because of several decades of compounding decisions motivated by aesthetics and not wanting to rock the boat. First, let's go back to 1832. This is when ranks below colonel first got distinct rank insignia coinciding with the adoption of the undress uniform. The new undress uniform was essentially a field duty uniform, which would display the rank on the shoulder straps or passants that normally held the ornate epaulets of the dress uniform. Key context going forward, the use of epaulets came first, so epaulets took precedence over the insignia. During this period, an officer's branch of service was a significant factor in the appearance of their uniform. Among the differences, infantry officers wore silver epaulets, while all the other officers, including general staff, wore gold epaulets. Branch colors also played a big part, but we won't be covering that today. Looking at the infantry, second lieutenants had no rank insignia. Rather, they were distinguished by their epaulet fringe diameter and officer uniform. First lieutenants and captains got one and two silver bars on their undress uniform respectively, but no rank insignia on their epaulet. The color for these bars was not symbolic, rather it was simply the same material that was used on the border for their shoulder strap. Prior to 1832, there was no distinction between a lieutenant colonel and a major in terms of their appearance, so in that year, the majors got the opposite color strap to distinguish them. The majors got gold oak leaves on their undress uniform, which coincided with the gold strap on their epaulets. Meanwhile, lieutenant colonels got silver oak leaves on their undress uniform, while colonels got gold US eagles. The eagles were gold to contrast with the silver of the epaulet, not for any particular symbolic reason. For non-infantry officers, the color scheme was flipped, with gold epaulets for the dress uniform and gold shoulder strap borders for the undress uniform. And lastly, the generals got their stars, but because generals are staff officers, they always had gold epaulets and silver stars to contrast with them. So at this point, color wasn't about seniority necessarily, it was about the branch an officer was in and corresponding with the other parts of the uniform. In 1851, the rank insignia were simplified. All officers would wear gold epaulets, and insignia worn on the epaulets themselves were silver to provide enough contrast. It's believed they went with gold epaulets and silver US Eagles for the colonels because there were more of these variations in circulation. Also during this period, the cavalry had taken precedence over the infantry during westward expansion, and the army was looking to create a more unified culture, which influenced the decision to make the infantry less distinctive. Meanwhile, on the undress uniform, first lieutenants, captains, and majors all standardized on gold insignia, while the higher ranks standardized on silver. This made sense when looking at the progression, because lower ranks would have the gold insignia with less contrast, while the higher ranks would have the higher contrast silver. While most ranks began wearing their insignia on their epaulets as well, majors and second lieutenants did not. This was because they were already easily identifiable by the lack of insignia and their epaulet fringe. Uniform regulations changed more significantly in 1872 when officers ranked colonel and below turned in their epaulets for shoulder knots with a velvet pad. At this point, all rank insignia with the exception of major and the US Eagle of the General of the Army rank insignia standardized on silver. Major was the only rank that couldn't, because the color difference was the only thing that distinguished them from lieutenant colonels, so it stuck. The Major also began wearing oak leaves on their shoulder knots, because there's no longer any fringe to distinguish them from second lieutenants. Later, around the time of the Spanish-American War, the use of khaki and olive drab field uniforms began to usurp the old undress uniform, which was actually more akin to the modern-day dress blues uniform used by the army. The old embroidered rank insignia were translated into metal pins for wear on the shoulder straps of the new field uniforms. While taking new shapes to fit the new materials, rank insignia before the 1920s actually mimicked the old embroidered style with fake stitching. At this time, the second lieutenant's lack of a rank insignia was still seen as acceptable because the field officer uniform was still different enough from the enlisted men to tell them apart. However, during World War I, a new need arose. In the trenches of Western Europe, most of the distinguishing features of the officer uniforms disappeared, and the rank insignia became the only way of telling an officer and a private apart. Key problem being, the second lieutenant did not have a separate rank insignia because this wasn't an issue before. This obviously wouldn't do, so they needed to come up with something. 
A few proposals were floated, one was giving the second lieutenant one silver bar, and changing the first lieutenant and captain ranks to two and three silver bars respectively. However, this would then mean changing other ranks insignia that had existed for almost a century. The path of least resistance would be to give the second lieutenants a new rank insignia, but what? The precedent of gold acting as a lower ranking version of its silver equivalent had already been set by the major rank ever since officer ranks were standardized in 1851. So the natural option was taking after this convention for the second lieutenant by making it a single gold bar contrasting with the silver bar of the first lieutenant. Now I've seen other explanations for this convention, but they're mostly myths, rationalizing it after the fact, or straight up incorrect. For example, there is the rationalization that gold is more malleable than silver, and it's all a metaphor for training entry-level company or field-grade officers. There's also the myth that the gold is actually meant to be bronze. This is just incorrect, because the regulations state that the insignia are intended to represent gold, regardless of what material they're actually made out of. So it essentially came down to not rocking the boat, which is fair enough as far as tradition goes. Whenever you look at anything military, especially traditions, you have to consider that not everything is planned out from the start. A lot of things are just what's left after stacking many decades of changes on top of each other. So this was the first episode in a new series we're doing called Snapshot, where we answer one self-contained but interesting question per video. If you have a question you'd like to see a Snapshot episode on, let us know in the comments. And thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our producers. If you want to support us and get some perks, including early access to videos and scripts, patron-only chat on our Discord, and exclusive wallpapers, consider becoming a patron. Link is in the description. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.